Thank you very much, Eitan. And I'm just uh, going now to conclude. But before you know, whenever there is a kind of panel and speaking about cyber, uh, we suddenly got a, a real, uh, not fake news, good news, which means the cyber is a uh, big business and uh, Israel made it uh, the big threat, a big opportunity as well. I just got an, a message, it's uh, honest, it's right. Schneider Electric decided to uh, uh, invest $25 million in 12 Israeli startups, but the message, and this is the very important thing, to be presented in the Israeli industry, it's much more important than having uh, an R&D center. I'm sorry that we don't have time for uh, Q&As. I would like very, very much, and please applause all our participants. I would like to thank uh, uh, Max Everett, Chief Information Officer, Department of Energy. I would like to thank uh, Rob Nolan, Director of Information Security and Compliance at Nobel Energy. Dmitry Kuznetsov, Chief Scientist and Senior Advisor to the Secretary, National Nuclear Security Administration at the Department of Energy. I would like to thank, of course, Yossi Schneck, uh, Senior Vice President of Israel Electric Company, Dr. Eitan Adar, Managing Director of Accenture Research and Technology, and Tom Alexandrovich, I did it right, Head of Electricity Guidance Department, Critical Infrastructure Division, Israel National Cyber Directory, and I would like very much to thank you for coming. But very special thanks are for Jennifer Lee. She is the one who worked uh, days and night and did a great job. Thank you very much. Shalom, Erev Tov. And I'm very happy and proud to ask to the podium uh, General Danny Bren, who is going to lead the next panel. Don't leave here. It's an excellent panel with excellent participants. Thank you very much. So good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The good news, we are almost there. The bad news, we have still one hurdle to go. Uh, without any further ado, I would like to ask to the, po to the uh, podium and for the panel, the participants. So with my, it's a pleasure to invite Mark Aziz, the CEO of Tetheray. <laughs> Yanir Lubishtein, uh, the Director of Global uh, Cybersecurity of PwC. Liora Teret, uh, Senior Director of Cybersecurity Research here in Israel for GE, and Chagai Katz, the Head of Government Sector in, with Checkpoint. So, I, was I really that boring? Okay, we have to change the background. So, we'll do like that. Um, I, I promise one thing. It's going to be very short. Uh, I've asked our participants to be very short uh, with the answers. I think that there are key questions that we should address after the sessions today because we heard a lot of technology. interest all of us is how we are going to have a better secured advanced digital industrial or infrastructure uh, business case so I would like to start with some general questions uh, for all the panelists if you could briefly first share with us what we are doing what what the company is doing what you serve within the IDS ICS sorry ICS uh, OT uh, domain and what is the claim of fame that can uh, contribute to our customers to, bet, to be better secured. So we'll start from the FART part. Can you hear me? I'm perfect. So my name is Mark Gesset, I'm a managing company called uh, Tetheray, and we use very deep uh, level of artificial intelligence, uh, <coughs> different than uh, systems that are currently being used, to identify unknown threats or unknown unknowns. Uh, first of all, our claim to fame is that everything was developed here in Tel Aviv University, 
One of the founders is professor at Tel Aviv University. The second founder, though, is, in, uh, uh, is from Yale, uh, but originally from Israel. He's a recipient of Golden Medal of Science by President Clinton, uh, 20 years on the advisory board of DARPA. Uh, and we believe that in the new world of uh, connected devices, uh, connected systems, connected financial devices, uh, the attacks are very different, different. Because people can, probably for the first time, attack critical infrastructure without getting even close to uh, that environment uh, and can be very creative in uh, building new uh, and uh, exciting, in their eyes, ways uh, uh, to cause harm uh, when we talk about financial institutions or financial devices to make money. Uh, and they have the ability to change it very fast. And uh, it's uh, also um, covered by government or governments uh, that can uh, create more additional ways. And we believe that the best way to deal with this type of issues is actually to uh, allow computers uh, to do protection and detection. And by the way, the bad guys are using artificial intelligence. They have unlimited, license, unlimited budgets and they are not um, uh, limited by regulations. So we believe that the only way to uh, fight with them is to use uh, to fight fire with fire, which is also use artificial intelligence, and that, that's what we do. Thank you. My name is Hagai. <coughs> Actually, uh, my expertise is not uh, OT and uh, SCADA systems. My role is to do nationwide protection systems. But my colleague who is doing cybersecurity has traveled. Why am I telling you that? Because if, I'm from Checkpoint, by the way. I didn't say. For the large Checkpoint, very few people deal with SCADA and OT. And that is just to mention that this is still a niche market. It's a very small market. If you compare the number of people, we have R&D, dedicated people, have a, but relative number of people who deal with this issue is relatively small to the uh, normal financial market and regular IT, but I believe it will change. It will change because eventually everything is becoming critical. Everything is connected. Uh, I can give a lot of examples why things that are in the past considered not to be critical are becoming critical. Just one example, if you take an airport and you say probably what is critical in an airport, probably you will say it's air traffic control, maybe it's the lighting of the runways and some safety issues. But just imagine an attack that happened in uh, Vietnam on the screens in the airport that tell you where to go, which gate, the flights. Just imagine a big, big airport operating without this screen. So this is a negligible system, but can really block an airport. And I believe that more and more system will become critical like this. So I'm here on behalf of what uh, Yossi said, the uh, CBL, Cyber by Luck, okay? Trying to help companies that did not do uh, uh, cyber design in, uh, by uh, originally, but of course we prefer to work with companies who de do design uh, as part of their planning. Uh, and we provide a lot of solutions for everything. Uh, IT, OT, uh, but uh, I, I probably will be able to speak about that a little bit later. Uh, so, uh, Danny asked uh, us to do it uh, quickly. So, I'm from uh, General Electric. Uh, we are one of the biggest uh, vendors of critical infrastructure uh, in the world. Uh, we actually, we are not a cybersecurity company. Uh, our goal is, uh, is uh, to make sure that our product will be secure and to work with uh, companies like Checkpoint and Tetheray uh, in order to make sure that our uh, customers will be secure, that uh, 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 people like uh, Yossi will uh, feel comfortable with their uh, job and making sure that uh, power will still continue. Good evening. Uh, my name is Yanir. I'm from PwC Israel. Uh, recently, we've been announced as a global center of excellence for PwC. Uh, to those of you who are not familiar with PwC, PwC is one of the big four companies, consulting companies in the world. And uh, again, recently we've been announced as a center of excellence for ICS and OT uh, protection. Uh, I joined PwC about a year ago. Before that, I was the head of the cybersecurity operations for the Ministry of Energy in Israel. And nowadays we are supporting governments and multinational organizations to protect their critical infrastructures.
So the next question will be, in your opinion, what is the number one challenge for industries today or organiza industrial organizations in dealing with cyber security? The number one challenge. So I will start, I think it's the fact that everything is connected. They have to keep everything is connected. Uh, if it's a power plant, it needs to be connected to be managed. If it's a wind farm, it needs to be connected. If it's a bank, it has to be connected because otherwise people will not do business with them. Uh, so on one hand, everything is connected and they need to provide services. On the other hand, the budgets are lowering and going down and uh, the level of attacks is going uh, higher. So it's almost an impossible world when the threats are increasing, the budgets are decreasing and there is a need to do business and there are many disruptors. How to, what to do in this environment that is uh, ever changing? I think this is the biggest challenge for the organizations. Okay. I'll start with saying what a lot of companies that deal with SCADA and OT are doing. They're looking at the OT systems and they, these systems are very different from IT in the sense that they're very stable. There are not a lot of changes. So what they do, they do a learning mode it could be a month or two months, and basically, once you freeze that, theoretically, you can block anything, because if everything is okay in the last two months, and you see any exception and you block it automatically, theoretically, you are protected. So okay. basically, we so don't have any problem. What? So theoretically. there isn't any problem. Theoretically. Theoretically. Practically, none of our customers in enabling the automatic block. None of our customers, although we have very high confidence that this is something irregular that should be stopped automatically because our customers are very afraid to stop automatic, the operation automatically. So we just raise the flag. Hopefully somebody is seeing that. Uh, and that is why these organizations are exposed because actually the malware is not coming through the OT typically. It's coming from the IT. Okay, and that's why you, I agree with you that you need to make a full security because the malware is coming from the IT, which is more connected to the rest of the world, and that's why you need layers of uh, communication, which is the IT, it's a separation or segmentation, and it's the OT, and you have to have clear uh, a distinction between them, but then, of course, you have to do the overlook of all the attack vectors, and that's why you need a solution that will provide you a comprehensive solution, and that is not easy, because this may be expensive, this is processes, but unless you do that, probably you just look, you're trying to protect, like, uh, with a straw, uh, a specific point, but not, not, you're not really protected. Uh, not exactly. They say that it came with disk on key into one of the computers and what? Inter yeah, that's what I say. Yeah, okay. Okay. What do you mean inside? It's from, from the outside. It came. Inside, yeah, but it, yeah, but it didn't came directly to the operating system. Typically, it came through one of the computers that is connected. Maybe, I don't, I don't know exactly. But anyhow, stuck there is not the whole world. Practically, we know that a lot of attack vectors are coming just from people using the computer in the operation that they just charge the computer, they let, they, uh, their mobile device. And then you open a, an attack vector, and from there, you go to the system. Uh, well, uh, as part of my job, I get to, to do a lot of uh, attacks to different uh, industrial systems. So uh, I got a lot of uh, experience from the attacker point of view to look on different systems and to look, you know, where are the, the gaps. Uh, usually the, you know, the, the standard answer for that is, you know, is all the legacy equipment that could be, you know, even 40 years old that uh, it's, still, it's still there and it's very hard to, to protect. But in, in my opinion, that's, that's not really the, the real challenge. And it's uh, something maybe related to what uh, uh, Haggai have mentioned. I think that what is missing right, right now, and it's across the board, is the ability to respond. Because there are technologies around detection that are there, there are uh, all sorts of ways to do hardening and uh, ways to do protection. The technology is available, but when you look in terms of response, so now you know that you have an attack, you have an actor inside your system, and you need to take actions to deal with that. And without, you know, just shutting down your entire facility, this is, uh, in my opinion, one of the biggest gaps. The technology in terms of maturity, 
it's not there yet. Kohen uh, still trying to understand what's going on, uh, to reduce the risk, but not to actually deal with an actual uh, attack when you are under it. I think that uh, it depends where you are in the world. I think the Israeli uh, example is an uh, amazing example in which both of the operators, and uh, you saw Yossi here explaining about uh, IEC cybersecurity, and I heard them for many years now. So the operators in Israel are quite mature. The regulation is there. Uh, we heard Tom. It's, it began in 2002, if I remember correctly, with the establishment of uh, NISA. So the Israeli market and the Israeli maturity is there. But if you're looking globally, there are two main challenges. One is the maturity of the vendors. Still nowadays, the vendors are a huge obstacle when it comes to cybersecurity. Most of them are very conservative and they are not willing to put any external devices, technology, solution in their system. And if they are willing to, uh, they are killing it softly, you can say because they are uh, raising the bars, uh, how to implement it with many, many constraints. And I'm sure that Rob can uh, uh, agree with me on that. And there is another thing, maturity of uh, operators which are not regulated by governments. This is another challenge that uh, we, service provider, solution provider, need to overcome. But we can see a huge uh, movement towards uh, market maturity uh, and if I can, you know, sum it all, all, all up, I think the most challenging uh, uh, obstacle that we have is to overcome the maturity of the vendors. Not the market, not the regulation, the vendors. Interesting thought. So let's, let's continue with you for a second, if, if it's okay. So, uh, we were shared a few minutes ago that it's a niche market. Being one of the big four companies, uh, consulting and, and and congratulations for, for becoming our PwC Center of Excellence here in Israel for uh, industrial cybersecurity. So d do you feel from addressing this issue with customers globally dif on different regions, on different verticals, that it's a niche market today? <coughs> Not like it used to be five years ago. Uh, five years ago, you can count on two hands and two legs, the number of uh, highly skilled cybersecurity professionals to the ICSOT environment. But nowadays, uh, due to training and maturity and awareness raising in the Western world, you can see more and more people learning this, the topic and, and becoming an expert in that. Uh, I know that uh, Daniel Enreich here is one of the first to be a cyber ICS cybersecurity expert. But you can agree with me that nowadays the numbers are rising. So uh, there is a, a movement around the globe toward the cybersecurity awareness when it comes to critical infrastructures, ICS and OT. Uh, still, there are some obstacles, like I mentioned earlier, but the, the general uh, perspective is things are moving in the right direction. So, Lior. Uh we were talking about uh, the prevention. Uh, so we heard one opinion that prevention is still not there because there is a technology uh, gap. On the other hand, there, there were some ideas that it's a human factor, the decision of human operators, those who run the their operational uh, lines day by day, to take the action. So. Where do you think this is, going, is the main challenge? So if, if I look on that, I think that definitely you'll see that a prevention technology as you see implemented on the IT front, you don't see, a, a, you don't see what you'd expect to see the amount of implementation in the OT uh, because, uh, arena. Because and, the technology is not there? And I don't think it's because of technology gap. I think it's because of an integration and uh, the adjustment that you need to do for OT. So, for example, uh, you, you can put a firewall but uh, in, in a specific location in your OT, but if there is a risk that it will drop one critical packet, uh, that 
that, that is something that uh, you know, a critical facility can, cannot uh, withstand. It's um, just the option for the risk of something like that. So you need to have uh, the equipment installed in a way that uh, allow the facility to continue with its targets. And it's a different uh, uh, processes, different mentality, different uh, manpower that are dealing with that. The, what we see in the IT, uh, the you know standard IT market, the there is already amazing and uh, technology. What is missing is adaptation. And yes, there are some uh, technology that you know you need to tweak a little bit, but it's it's all there. Uh, the, uh, and what you are seeing is that it's quite a challenge. This is why you are seeing a lot of effort around detection. That's the easiest adaptation that you can do from an IT to OT uh, uh, without creating any risk. Once you're talking about other phases, you need to be an uh, expert in the system they are working with. You need to collaborate with the different uh, vendors, with the operators. It's not just, you know, it's on the shelf if you want and uh, just install it. It's a different approach and you need to have the mindset for that. Uh, so at least this is uh, my, my approach. Uh, it's just uh, adjusting to a market that so far didn't got the attention. So let's talk a little bit about educating the market. Uh, Haggai, with your permission. Uh, Checkpoint was the first or one of the first uh, cyber security companies globally when nobody even thought there is a problem anywhere. Uh, so you came with the idea of firewall. It took, I think, uh, a substantial uh, time to educate the market that there is the need. But today, I think that you are one of the leading, if not the leading firewall and cybersecurity vendors in the world. How we, you would propose uh, us, the, who is sitting in, in today in the room, uh, to, es to expedite the education process of both vendors and operate operators, because governments, I, because I come from the government side, I can tell you it will take time. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll I see. think I think that uh, in many aspects, this discussion today focuses very much on energy and power and so on. Uh, I think there is, there is awareness there. There are a lot of issues. Cooperation, for example, as you said, it's very hard to get cooperation from the company who provides SCADA to expose their and to cooperate. Uh, on uh, securing their SCADA communication, for example. It is a process unless the customer is shouting, hey, go and do cooperation, uh, sometimes they're reluctant to do it. Uh, they don't want to stop the system. They, don't want, they, they are not software companies. They are hardware companies. The software part is a small element within their business. So I think it, this is progressing. I think that we have much higher uh, risk in other areas, which are OT. Uh, you can take any smart city, any camera, hospital is terrible. Uh, that I think this, is, this has to go with awareness. It will come with some incident, unfortunate incident will come, but also education and regulation. I agree uh, with what said, was said in the beginning, that's a matter of regulation. We take the uh, healthcare uh, market, which is already, already IoT, with, they say that the C in IoT is the security or cyber, but there's no C. Act. True, there's no security. Literally zero security in, in healthcare. And there are devices that could be done. I just broke to the table this small device. Okay, you can put it in line and by 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 factors increase the security just by encrypting the information and verifying that the communication will go from one point to the other and not through uh, strange ways. It can be done, it has to be cheap. This is the challenge for the future. This is actually Gen 6 micro cyber security that will manage and control the communication. Again, this device doesn't provide 100%, but it's by far more secure than what we currently have. And this will apply to many markets with IoT and eventually will flow, will bring security into the uh, critical infrastructure, which is the next the next layers, as Yossi said, there's the core layer, but there are a lot of outer layer who eventually will influence uh, the core activity. So getting back to technology, and Mark, maybe I, I would like to apologize because you're getting the unfair question of, of tonight. Cool. Uh, we see every, 
every other week or every other day a new technology, a new box that will solve all CISO's problems and then CISO's can start finally sleep an entire uh, night and not have any interesting things happening on Friday evenings and ruining their, their weekends. But still we see a lot of successful attacks even when we install all those cool advanced technologies. How can you explain this? Actually, it's the best question I could ever ask. Um, Thank you. Can I have it in writing? <laughs> and just for the full disclosure, uh, General Electric uh, keep investing in our company uh, while they compare us to other cool technologies and they stopped investing in those technologies. PwC did the first global JBR in Israel with us. And it's all happening because we do believe that it's not about technology. It's about value. It's about providing real value. I just want to convert it from a slogan to a real example, and I will, draw, I will take the Stuxnet attack as an example. Now, by the way, since it's recorded, we all know that everything we say about Stuxnet, just according to the foreign press, nothing necessary happened. But uh, according to the press, uh, you know, a virus was there, and we can discuss ways how it got there, and they changed the speed of the non-G Siemens centrifuges, uh, and Siemens PLC is running Windows NT. And the cool thing is that it's impossible to discover it using existing technology tools. You can't put a firewall because in Boucher, under the mounting, there was no firewall. It was disconnected from the internet. You can't use antivirus solutions, no matter how sophisticated they are, because there was no network signature. You actually need to do something totally different, which is look at operational data, speed, velocity, temperature of the centrifuges to identify that something wrong is going on. And by the way, according to the foreign press, they also hacked the command and control center, the historian, what we called. So it played historical data again and again and again. Makes it very interesting. Um, and it happens because the world has changed. Let me give you an example that is much closer to us. We talked about huge rotating devices, airline engines, um, turbines that produce electricity. But let's take a very small rotating device called dispenser, this device, it's a motor, it's inside an IoT device called ATM. You know, ATM is an industrial device that is connected to the internet these days. And there is a PLC that is usually running Windows XP and Windows C, right, Lior? This is the small computer that controls the engine of the ATM. Hackers found that it's very easy to hack into those ATMs. And then you send scattered device commands straight to the motor, make them spin, Every time you push a button somewhere outside of the country, money literally coming out of the uh, hole in the wall. And the reason it's happening because the world of crime, the world of attacks has totally changed. It's not people that come in and uh, trying to use network to hack into the devices. They use totally different vectors. And your question about Stuxnet was a very good one because the attack vector was totally different. And existing systems, and of course I'm not uh, objective, but there is a reason why on one hand, GE and airline companies, on the other hand, companies like Citi and Santander and others look our solutions. Being able to, to educate the, the vendors, the operators, the, the users, and let's do take into consideration that within those uh, plants, you don't have very advanced IT guys that can operate technologies in most cases. So, so I'm a little bit confused. What are we going to suggest our uh, customers, our partners, our ecosystem partners? What is going to be, and with this, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will adjourn. Uh, what your, your suggestion is to the next step? What should they do in order not to be calm? So you said that statistically the, the, guys, the good guys are winning, but there is one guy that the lion ate eventually because the lion always goes to sleep when he's not hungry anymore. So uh, how can we make sure that we are not the prey that the lion got, but our neighbor is? Well, I will start and I, I think that what happens in the world of uh, critical infrastructure is actually exactly what happens in the world of warfare in general. You know, war becomes an asymmetric war. And, I, uh, and it's absolutely right what you said, you know. Uh, when uh, Lior does his job at GE, he has to protect 420,000 people constantly, every day. And he has to have a lot of people doing it. And you need only one bad guy to do only one good action to hurt the system and shut down a power plant. But that's exactly what's happening in the warfare as well. So I think the first thing that our customers need to understand, and I think they do get it, airline companies and power companies, 
is that it's an asymmetric game. It's that the cost of protection are much higher than the cost uh, uh, of attack. Uh, so that's the first suggestion. Second suggestion, I very much agree with the fact that detection is extremely important, but it's always have to be an actionable detection, which can lead to protection, to uh, mediation, and to mitigation of the threats. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is very little uh, uh, they can do. And the third thing is to understand that you can't learn from the history. You know, some power plants exist for 50 or 60 years, the same equipment. Um, internet exists for less time than that. So they really need to get that uh, new technologies bring new type of threats. And it's not an easy combination, but the combination, if I summarize it, between asymmetric warfare, new type of technologies that used for attack, all types of technologies that being attacked, and sometimes abundance of uh, uh, threats and uh, um, more difficulty to get uh, to receive the money, it's a challenge. Uh, but that's what I would recommend. And also to make sure that if there are stories about critical attacks, the decision makers and the organizations understand and know it, um, uh, so they can increase the budgets. I know that this is the last question, uh, but I, I do want to say that we still haven't seen the really devastating attacks in the world of critical infrastructure. We've seen some stuff in Russia, in Ukraine, etc. Uh, but I think what naturally will happen, something will happen. People will understand that uh, uh, it's a difficult situation. They will understand that they need to release uh, more budgets. And then those that will be ready there, the CIS of those organizations, I think will have a very uh, lucrative position in their organizations. So I think the crisis, when you really go into crisis, understand how it differentiates from Stuxnet, is a, is a wake-up call to those very nasty things that may happen. Absolutely. Now, I do not call bad guys to attack, but unfortunately... It happens. It happens. Yeah. Well, I agree that uh, it's an asymmetric war. Uh, and it's, it may be cheaper to attack than to protect, but what we have to measure is what the consequences of attack. The consequences of attack could be much more severe than the cost of preventing. Just an example, uh, in that sense I disagree with you. We do have, I wouldn't say devastating uh, attacks. Just take the last uh, NotPetya on a company like Maersk that affected operational system, all the all the uh, system of, of moving uh, uh, containers and so on, they lost $300 million. Now, probably they could invest, invest their money, and they do invest in security better to protect against it, but also it applies also to government. Just think of how much tax the Danish government lost because they lost $300 million. It's a lot of money. So, yes, it's asymmetric. Nevertheless, we are more than them. We are more than, we have more resources, and it's worthwhile to protect our assets because the consequences of attack is much more painful than the cost of investing. Um, I have a, a simple uh, suggestion. So, again, we, we see a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, facilities and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, operators of critical infrastructure, and uh, to be honest, you can see places that are more secure and places that are less secure. I think that in the end, uh, the, 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 the main gaps and where, what you need to do in order to, to change your level is first be willing to spend some uh, money and resource on that, and second, uh, learn from someone that already have done it. I'm not talking about uh, a, a, you know just asking uh, people, but going to someone. I can tell you, for example, in our organization, we actually went to the Israeli electric company and talked with uh, Yossi to see the, the structure that is made there. It's a great example for you know, in-depth cybersecurity in uh, critical uh, facilities. And I think that uh, you can see it's happening. It's there. Uh, just a matter of spending some money and, and learning from, the, from our partners, from uh, our peers, in order to do that. It's, uh, it's not uh, that difficult once you are willing to spend uh, the effort for it. I completely agree with you, Leo. Uh, it's a matter of uh, identifying and uh, accepting the risk. And once uh, these things happen, 
then you need to approach it and to uh, treat it like you treat uh, the traditional IT or your safety uh, culture in the, in the facility. Identify the, tr the risk and use a basic hygiene in order to mitigate uh, those risks. I think this is the basic thing that any uh, facility, plant, whatever, should do. And as soon as you use your basic hygiene, then the attacker will go to the other one, which is not as secure as you are. And this is, you know, it's very simple, very cliche maybe, uh, corny, but th this is the fact. So you're suggested to buy a better uh, running shoes. Just yep, run exactly, a little exactly, bit faster yeah. than your, your friend. Um, maybe last, one last comment by myself with your permission, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we were talking about governments. I would uh, suggest that you go to the YouTube and fi try to find the 2018 budget address of Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor. It was, I th if I remember correctly, she, she helped. It was, the discussion was uh, happened on May 15th. It's in German, uh, but you, you, you can put the Google translation something on YouTube there. And she, it was a very interesting uh, dis discussion, and, and she gave a, an excellent uh, talk. But then she started, and I was listening while I was working on, on, on my computer. And then she said something about uh, digitization and infrastructure. It was in German, so please don't make me. I can't understand German. It's a little bit more difficult to speak. Uh, and then he said, we are entering an era of hybrid warfares where nations will have to uh, meet both kinetic use of force whether those are terrorists or enemies or and cyber uh, use of force and because germany is an advanced economy that is basing on their industry she has decided to uh, establish and finance the german cyber command that needs to not only see to that that the German military will be uh, secured, but also the general digital infrastructure of Germany will be. So it was very surprising for me. And, and I think, and, and I would like to apologize to our government because I, I, I wasn't speaking about regulation because I, th I know the excellent work that you are doing. I think that the idea here of trying to find new ways, how much money did the Swedish government lost from, from this loss, is trying to bring governments to take a, a more positive action, if you'd like, initiative and contribute to the ecosystem of r cyber risk management within their nations and joint effort between nations to be able uh, to, again, hire the bars for those bad actors that uh, got very strong and powerful weapons from somewhere to be able to have a, a much smaller effect on our day-to-day -day lives and businesses. So with that, I would like to thank you for being such a great audience. And if you can, and I would like to thank our great panelists, and I wish you an excellent uh, evening, and the bars are still open. So thank you.